Sarah Tom. Nice to meet you. Tom. Nice to meet you. Sarah. A reminder in case you need it that your project is due on Monday at 5 o'clock and I did send out an Excel spreadsheet asking for your summary numbers. I sent it out again in case it's gotten lost in the emails where all I want is your intrinsic value, your relative value, your option value if you have it and a recommendation, buy, sell or hold. So it's seven things on your company 
and I'd like to get it by Sunday and the reason is very simple. Today we're going to actually finish the lecture note packet. We're going to be done. But on Monday what I'm going to do actually is take your numbers and show them back to you. What percentage of companies came out as undervalued and overvalued, what were the most under... So in a sense you can see in real time what you found in this class. But to do that I need your numbers. So I'll send this, uh, the, the, the Excel spreadsheet out and if you can send it in as a group, if you can, right? So we have five people, if you can send in all five. But you always in every group have that one person you know the one I'm talking about, who's really not even picked a company yet? Yeah? I, I, you know who, who I'm talking about. Eh? Don't wait for that person. So if you have four out of five, I'd much rather get four out of five than none out of five. So wait till Saturday, and if it looks like this person's going to get done, wait for that person. If it looks like they're still thinking about the company to value on Saturday, cut them loose. Eh? Give me the numbers, let them kind of figure out what to do in 24 hours. But I, want, I would like to get your numbers because that's what's going to drive the Monday session. Okay. The second is your final exams. As I've told you, we only finally, I, the Google shared spreadsheet I checked yesterday, there are about 50 people signed up for the final exam, which is fine because you have 160 people in that room. So I, no, I think we were okay. So even if you decide by Monday that you want to take the early exam, it's okay. I think I can handle it up to Monday. But let's make Monday the absolute deadline because by that time I'd like to know how many people are going to take the early final. So don't wait till Tuesday night to make the decision. So just make the decision early enough that you can let me know and go and sign in there so I can know how many people are taking the exam. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, go back and check your emails on the Google Shared Spreadsheet. Okay? So let's look at the very last segment of this class. Up to this point, we've been looking at valuation from the outside in. You know what I mean by the outside in? We're looking at companies as investors. And when you do that, you're in a sense passive. There's not much you can do as an outsider looking at a company. So you can look at a company like Yahoo and say, if I were CEO, I would do this. But the reality is you're not CEO, Marissa Myers. So when you value Yahoo, you've got to value the company run by the existing management. So for 24 sessions of this class, we've been almost karmic in our view about companies, which is, this is the way it is, I'm going to value it and let it go. Today we're actually going to go on the inside. We're going to look at companies from the inside out, and all of a sudden, levers that you were just looking at are now levers that you can control. Like what? I mean, some of you are valuing companies, we look at the company and say, what's wrong with this company? They're insane. They keep taking bad projects and they keep digging the hole deeper. And you valued the company, there wasn't much you could do about it. But if you ran the company, you wouldn't do that, right? Or you're valuing a company which has no debt and all equity, and you're saying, if I ran this company, I'd borrow money. But as an investor, you can't do that. But if you're running the company, you could change your debt ratio. Or you could look at a company and say, then you look at commodity companies. They're certifiably insane in terms of their dividend policies, continuing to pay dividends in the face of disaster. So if I ran that company, I wouldn't do that. Now I'm going to let you change. And if any of this sounds familiar, that was actually the entire corporate finance class. In a sense, I've reversed the classes. In corporate finance, we spent 24 sessions on the inside looking out, and the 25th session on the outside looking in, this class was spent 24 sessions the outside looking in, now we're going to go on the inside. But by now, those of you who have been in my corporate finance class essentially have all the tools at your disposal. So let me start the, the session off with our usual start of the class test. Unfortunately, I didn't bring the, the slides. I'm going to read you, so if you don't have it, don't worry. It's pretty straightforward. It's as I read, if you don't have the page, just take a look at it. Okay? So let's start with this question, value enhancement or not. I'm going to make a big deal when I start this session about the difference between price enhancement and value enhancement. And to understand the difference, let me read you a series of actions that a company takes and you tell me whether you think this is a value enhancing action using your concept of what value is. The first is a stock split. Can a stock split enhance value? What does a stock split do? change the number of units in the company, right? From 100 to 1,000, from 1,000 to 100,000, or if it's a reverse stock split in the other direction. 
It doesn't affect cash flows. It doesn't affect growth. It doesn't affect risk. It cannot affect value. Let me ask you a follow-up question. Can a stock split affect the price? Absolutely. Now do you see the distinction value and price? Value we're talking about fundamentals. Price we're talking about perceptions, mood, momentum. Right? Let's take a second action. Amortizing goodwill. All that money you're paying accountants to come in and tell you whether your goodwill is impaired or not. The accountant says, oh my god, it's impaired. Value changing? It's value changing if and only if what's true. One is it's tax deductible and the second is, this is news to you. You're saying, oh my god, that was a bad acquisition? I never knew that. How many times has, does that ever happen? When the accountant says, we've made a mistake, you said, what took you so long? So accounting impairment of goodwill can affect the price maybe, but cannot really affect the value unless it affects taxes. Maybe if you're in Spain, it could. Right? We talked about the, the tax laws. In Changing depreciation methods just in your reporting books. You know how companies do this, right? It's perfectly legal in the US to maintain two sets of books, and most companies do. There's the tax books, which you show the IRS, and there's the reporting books, which you see in the 10K, the 10Q, the annual reports. So lots of companies use different depreciation methods in the two. You see, why would you do that? When you're doing your tax books, use accelerated depreciation. Why? It lowers your income, but it also lowers your taxes. But when you do your reporting books, you're allowed to switch and claim straight line depreciation. I don't know why they allow it, to be quite honest. I think you should have one set of books. But let's say you do switch depreciation just in your reporting books. You're going to report higher earnings, right? Your earnings per share are going to come in above expectations. Value enhancing? Why not? Your earnings went up. Your reported earnings went up, but your cash flows and the value don't change because it's the same true earnings, the same tax savings. So changing depreciation methods just in your reporting books can't make a difference. Issuing tracking stock on your social media business. You know what tracking stock is? In the late 90s, companies used to do this with their dot-com businesses. DLJ did it. I think the New York Times might have done it with their own New York Times online. What they would do is they'd carve out the portion of their business that they said was their dot-com or social media business. They would issue shares against it, and they'd let people buy these shares. See, this is amazing. The only thing with tracking stock is these are not separated companies. They still remain part of the, the basic companies. And the New York Times still runs the New York Times online. There's no board of directors, no management. I couldn't believe that people would actually buy tracking stock for the simple reason that you're completely unprotected. I'll give you a very simplistic and over-the-top example. What if the New York Times charges $100 per minute for use of the copier to the New York Times online business? You could do that, right? It's an intra-company transaction. It's going to make your earnings look awful. It's going to make the New York Times much better. You're saying, my board of directors will protect me. What board of directors? You have nothing. It can't change your value because it's still the same business, but can it affect, can it affect your price? So all of a sudden, you become a social media company, right? And what happens once you become a social media company? Its number of users times $100 per user. It's only half in jest that two days ago when I wrote about Yahoo, I said, if you're going to sell yourself, stop talking about the search engine. Nobody uses it. Stop talking about Yahoo News. It's like the Daily Mail. You know what you should talk about? There are still a billion people who use Yahoo. I haven't run into very many of them recently. I don't know where they are. <laughs> there are still 250 million Yahoo Mail users. I don't know whether you remember getting these mails. They said, do you Yahoo would ask at the bottom. One of them happens to be my mother, who is 77 and not that tech savvy. And that's become their core business, but there are 250 million of them. I said, forget about me. So don't talk about your business. It's depressing. Talk about users. What are you hoping to do? You're hoping that people forget that you've been around a long time, think you're a social media company, and pay $100 per user. You say, who'd be crazy enough to do it? 
find somebody who's willing to bet the farm. Some CEO wants to become a superstar CEO. The advice that was meted out to Marissa Meyer should be advi advice that somebody else is meeting out to some other CEO, and maybe you can benefit. Okay. So no, if you look at all of those actions, none of those affect the value, but all of them can affect the price. So we're going to start off today by drawing that distinction. Now let's look at a more interesting case. Let's suppose that you've gone out to work, you've got a great reputation, you become a turnaround CEO. You have this reputation as a turnaround CEO. I bring you into a large multi-business company. You've just become CEO, and you look around, there are four businesses. They're very creatively named A, B, C, and D. Okay? I'll give you the characteristics of the business, I'll let you look at them. If you look at the four businesses, I've given you the return on capital and cost of capital for each of the four businesses. Even if you don't have the piece of paper in front of you, you'll notice that there's some really good businesses and some really bad. What do I mean by good and bad if I'm giving you return on capital and cost of capital? In some of these businesses, the return on capital is way above the cost of capital and some it's way below. Ready? You become CEO of the company. You've got four businesses ranging from really good to neutral to bad. Which business would you divest if your objective is to increase value? This sounds like a slam dunk, right? What are we taught to do in strategy classes? And what do most turnaround CEOs do once they come into a company? Get rid of the, the dogs in the business. The BCG framework comes out, right? Keep your stars, keep your cash cows, get rid of the dogs. You herd them to the door and say, get out of here. But what does, how does a divestiture affect your value? It's like a net present value of a project reversed, right? In a typical project, what do you do? You invest up front, you get cash flows later. In a divestiture, what happens? You get the cash flows up front, you give up the cash flows on that divested business later. And what's the effect of taking a project on your value? If the net present value is positive, your value will go up as a company. In the case of a divestiture, do you see what that means? For a divestiture to increase your value, what has to be true? What you get from the divestiture has to be greater than keeping that business as a continuing business. So what's the question I'm asking? When you look at these four businesses and when you go to sell them, which of these four businesses are people most likely to overpay, right? That's really the question. What do you think the answer to that question is? Are your dogs going to be the ones that people say, oh my God, give me that dog? Are your stars the one that people are going to be willing to pay huge premiums for? I think the stars. In fact, this goes counter to everything you're taught in restructuring. Because in restructuring, it is get rid of the bad businesses. But the question you have to ask is at what price? Look at what Ford did with Jaguar Land Rover. It got rid of what it thought was a bad business, but it got rid of it at an even worse price. That's not a great way to build up value. So think about divestitures with a little more nuance. It's not just getting rid of bad business, getting rid of bad businesses, or even good businesses that people will overpay for. Let's talk about financing decisions. Company has 200 million in debt and 800 million in equity. So it's 80-20 now. Its optimal debt ratio is 20%. So it's already at its optimal. The CEO says, look, I can increase my debt and lower the cost of capital. You know what this, 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 this belief comes from, right? Because the cost of debt is always lower than the cost of equity. If I replace debt, I mean, equity with debt, my cost of capital will go down. What's the flaw in the logic there? If you're already at your optimal, what's going to happen? As you increase your debt ratio, it's true that you're replacing more expensive equity with cheaper debt, but what else is happening? Both the cost of equity and the cost of debt are going up, and if you're moving beyond your optimal, what you lose by doing it will exceed what you gain. So we're going to come back to that optimal capital structure. It's not as simple as just go out and borrow money. It's cheap and it's a tax benefit. It's not going to increase value. Final question. Google is $60 billion in cash. It's probably up to 80 by now. Okay. It decides to return a chunk of that cash in stock buybacks. Your stockholders in Google. After this buyback, are you going to be better off, neutral, 
or worse off? This is actually a central question about buybacks. Can buybacks change your value? I, we know they can affect the price. That's a different question, but can they change the value? Or let me phrase it differently. What has to be true for a buyback to change value? But remember, this is cash. This cash is not invested. So you have to finish the story. You have bad projects, and you expect the company to do what with the cash? Okay. Invest in the bad projects, right? It's a combination. If you have cash, and I worry about the fact that you have bad projects, and you're going to take those bad projects, then I'm going to punish you. It's that cash discount. But you need both pieces, right? So it's not just bad projects. It's the fact that you have managers who keep taking bad projects. Do you think Google fits that characteristic? Eh, their Google Glass was obviously a big waste of money. But for two, it's a $2 billion, you know, I guess you can think of it as Sergey Brin's toy or Larry Page's toy, and he wrote it off, right? I mean, he could have bought the Los Angeles Clippers with the $2 billion, but I guess that's just as bad an investment as... Uh, but if you think about Google, you don't think of it as a company that takes bad projects. It gives back six billion the day after the buyback. What's different? Your stock price is going to be down. So you think that's bad. But what compensates for it? If you've sold your share, if you, I'm sorry, the stock price might not be down, but if you sell your shares back, your holdings will be down by how much you sell back. But you're compensated by the fact that you have cash in your pocket. A buyback can be a neutral event. In the case of Google, I think it'll be a neutral event. It can be a positive event. You know when it's going to be a positive event? When you have a company that you don't trust. Or it can be a negative event if you have a company that by buying back the stock is going to get itself into trouble because it's not going to be able to take investment. What do you think would happen if Glencore announced a stock buyback tomorrow? This is insanity, right? This company is on the verge of bankruptcy. This notion that buybacks are somehow good news for investors all the time has to be dispensed with because it varies across companies. So you ready? Let's get today's session started by looking at the distinction between price enhancement and value enhancement. These two graphs, I think, bring home the distinction better than anything I can say. And I'm going to say it anyway, so it kind of... So the first graph comes from a study in the late 1990s that looked at companies that changed their names. You say, what's the big deal? Companies change their names all the time. These companies changed their names in a very specific way. They added dot .com to their names, and this subset of companies actually changed nothing about the company. So think day before, day after. All that's different is yesterday you used to be called XYZ company, today you're called XYZ.com company. What's the value effect? Don't think too long. What, it's the same company, same cash flow, same growth, same risk. That's what the market did on the day that you added dot .com to their names. It went up by 150%. We've been wasting our time for 24 sessions talking about cash flows, growth, and risk. We should have been talking about what's a better name for your company. 150% are saying, this is great. Why am I wasting my time on all this intrinsic value stuff? Here's a second graph from a few years later, five years later, in 2002. This study also looked at companies that changed their names. You know what they did? They took .com out of their names. Why? Because it was this post.com bust. .com was now a bad thing to have. So they took it out of their names. And guess what? The market said, this is wonderful news. Stock price jumps up again. Most of the time when CEOs talk about value enhancement, they're talking about price enhancement. They're saying, what can I do to increase the price? That's what they want your advice on. Hey, should I buy back stock? Will that be a good thing? Maybe I should change my name. And with price enhancement, what you're effectively doing is you're playing the pricing game. And remember what we said about the pricing game. What drives prices? It's mood and momentum. It's moving that. So what you're doing in price enhancement might have nothing to do with value enhancement. The danger of trying to keep the market happy, it's like trying to keep a manic depressive happy. It never lasts very long. And when it leaves, it leaves you with a really, really bad feeling about the whole process. Too many CEOs, I think, and this is why I think companies should stop 
catering to sell side equity research analysts. I think it's one of the most dangerous things I've seen companies do is become so focused on if we keep sell side equity research analysts happy, that's good for us, right? You're playing the pricing game and guess what? What they like today, they will not like tomorrow. Just ask Twitter. I mean, why do you think they hired Anthony Noto? You know where Anthony Noto, who's, a, who's Twitter's CFO, came from, right? He came from Goldman Sachs. He was actually the dot-com analyst at Goldman Sachs in the late 90s. At Celsa, and they hired him because they said, this guy knows the language of equity research analysts. He will be able to keep them happy. Fat lot of good that's done them. So I am not interested in price enhancement because I don't know how to do it. It's too dangerous a game. I'm sure there are other classes that can talk about price enhancement. What I want to focus on is value enhancement. And very simply, to enhance value, I've got to go to one of those numbers that shows up in my valuation. And I can take all of restructuring and boil it down into how it affects one of those four numbers. The first, of course, is the cash flows from existing assets. If I can find a way to increase the cash flows from my existing assets, holding all else constant, that's critical, then I'm going to increase my value as a company. So I'm going to start there. Second, I'm going to go to growth. Growth, I know, is one of those nuanced issues. Higher growth by itself doesn't increase value. But maybe you can increase the portion of your value that comes from growth, either by increasing investments, if you have lots of good opportunities, or cutting back on investments. So when you say go for value from growth, it can come from both higher growth and lower growth, depending on your company. The third is, I could lower my cost of capital, right? Now, when you think about lowering cost of capital, you normally think about changing the mix of debt and equity. We'll talk about a couple of other things you might be able to do as well. And finally, maybe you can increase the length of your growth period. An Excel spreadsheet, that's easy to do. Just make 5, 10. But with a real company, this means building up your competitive advantages and barriers to entry. Maybe those strategy classes mattered after all, because this is where they come in. So let's start with increasing cash flows from existing assets. I bring into a company, you look around and say, this is an incredibly inefficiently run company. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to cut costs and you're going to run businesses more efficiently. When I hear those words, what I hear is higher margins from the existing revenue. So in a sense, what I'm going to try to do is when you say a word, I'm going to say, oh, this is where it's going to show up. Easier said than done because it's easy to talk about cost cutting. It's much more difficult to deliver it. But if you can do it, that's where I see it. The second is that if you have businesses that are losing money, that have been losing money for a long time, and you expect them to lose money forever, stop. Because why keep these businesses going? Just shut them down. You're saying, this is obvious. That would have happened already. You know when this happens most frequently is when a new CEO comes in and looks around and says, that is a crazy business. You should never have been in it. Why didn't the old CEO admit to it? In behavioral finance, there is this finding that when you buy a stock and it starts going down, you keep holding it and holding it and holding it and never selling it. You know it's a horrible company. You should get rid of it. But every day when you open up your portfolio and you look at it, you kind of put your hands right over the stock. I, 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 I don't have any Twitter in my portfolio. Or no, no, I, GoPro, I, I don't even see it. You know why? Because the act of selling something is the admission that you screwed up. Just as Brian Cashman two years ago, if he said, I'm going to cut a rod loose, would have admitted that, the, that he was the guy who signed a rod. The fact that you sell something is an admission. So what happens is mistakes stay on your books. Until somebody who didn't make the mistake comes in and says, that was a mistake. So divest businesses that are losing money, they expect to lose money forever. Third thing is going to sound mildly unpatriotic, but take it for what it's worth. I have never believed that it should be the objective of any company to maximize taxes paid to the government. Maybe you believe differently, but let me cover myself fully here. Within the framework of the law, you need to pay the taxes that you should be paying, but not a penny more. So if you can find a way to pay less taxes, go for it. That's what Pfizer is doing with the Allergan deal, right? Now you can sit there and debate the moralistic issues, but the reality is you're the CEO of a publicly traded company. There is this tax code out there that's insane. It's not your job to do the right thing for an insane tax code. Do whatever the tax code allows you to do. 
And there are a couple of things you can do. One is to do what Pfizer did. I call this, Paul, I've always called this pulling a Beyond Borg. For those of you who have no idea who, who I'm talking about, I used to play a lot of tennis, and the very first Wimbledon that I followed on TV was 1976. In 1976, a 17 year old Swede called Bjorn Borg came out of nowhere and won Wimbledon. He was the most unorthodox grass court player you could think. I mean, he was a classic clay court player, even though I have no idea what I'm talking about. When you're a player on clay, you have all the time in the world. You can take these big looping back swings, and Bjorn Borg did that. We even try playing Wimbledon grass, which is like only for cows. The ball just goes through. But he had such quick reflexes that he won it. The headline that year said, Borg of Sweden wins Wimbledon. Great. 1977, he comes back and does it again. And the headline says, Borg of Monte Carlo wins Wimbledon. So what the heck happened here? Did Monte Carlo invade Sweden while I wasn't watching? Sometimes things happen in Northern Europe where nobody notices, especially in Scandinavia. <laughs> but you know what happened? In the 1970s, the marginal tax rate in Sweden on individuals was 90%. So if you won Wimbledon, what were you doing? You collected the check and you mailed it out to the tax guy. You were like an intermediary. So sometime in 76, Borg started thinking, do I have to be Swedish? I know ABBA needs to be Swedish. The king of Sweden might need to be Swedish. I don't have to be Swedish. I can be Monte Carlo. I don't even know whether that's the right word for somebody who lives in Monte Carlo. That's what companies are trying to do. And if you're a multinational, you really don't even have to move countries, right? Have you ever, do you have any friends who work in transfer pricing? What is transfer pricing? Anybody want to give me a definition of transfer pricing? What do those guys do? Lots of them around this country who work in transfer pricing. Oh no, well, that's a very cynical way of describing what they do. If you ask them from a noble perspective what they do, they would say, hey, well, we're just setting prices for intra-company transactions. So when Google Ireland sells something to Google US, we go through the economics of it and say, this is the right price to charge, really. How naive do I look? Transfer pricing is designed to move your income from high tax locales to low tax locales within the framework of the law. It's an incredible waste of intellectual power to be spent, all these people to be working on it. But that's what the tax code begets. And I'm not a great fan of risk management. I think that's too much risk management. There's one potential benefit you get from tax perspective. You have spikes in your tax rate. At su I mean, there used to be a super normal tax that was applied on oil companies in the early 80s when they were making too much money. So some of them would use risk management to keep their income below that, that, that level that triggered it. So what it allows you to do is smooth out earnings. Again, reducing taxes. If you've overinvested in the past, live off the fat for a while. You don't have to build a factory every year. This isn't some road thing that you have to do. So if you're at 300% capacity, Live off the fat. What, do, what does that mean? Well, you get depreciation coming in, plus depreciation, but you don't have to put out the capex because you're at overinvestment. And if you're a company that has significant working capital needs, a retailer managing working capital can do amazing things to your cash flows. I mean, that's the revolution that Walmart wrought on the retail business, right? When I took accounting, I remember being taught that your current ratio should be two to one. You know what that means? that your current assets should be twice your current liabilities. That's what I was taught. Healthy companies have two to one current ratios. I don't know where this came from, some rule of thumb. And somebody at Walmart said, why? The accountant said, what do you mean why? That's in the books, two to one. They said, why can't it be one to one? Because when it's two to one, what happens? You're tying up a lot of cash in working capital, right? Inventory is twice your, he said, why can't we make it one to one? And in fact, that's what Walmart does. It tries to use its just-in-time inventory, its capacity to keep inventory low, to keep its working capital needs minimized. I do have to let you know a dirty little secret of this aspect of value creation. It's going to be costly to others, right? So when we talk about cost cutting, it's great for you as a stockholder, but who's bearing the cost? Somebody's being laid off, so, you know, society. so in a sense, there is a cost to somebody else. When you talk about saving value from reducing tax, it's true, it's good for your stockholders, but taxpayers are subsidizing. 
even working capital. Do you know that who Walmart squeezes to keep its inventory levels so low? If any of you work with suppliers to Walmart, you are the low person on the totem pole. They essentially squeeze you, and you can squeal as much as you want, but if 60% of your revenues come from Walmart, you're going to take it because you can't leave it. This is why when this is the main focus for value enhancement, don't expect people to treat you kindly because you are, in a sense, creating side costs, and you're going to get a backlash. And if you're a public company, that backlash is going to happen in the open. Remember the L, B, O? The L was, of course, the leverage. The B was the buy and the out. What's the out? You take a public company and you make it private. You're saying, why would I want to do that? Well, if you have to do a lot of this stuff, it's easier to do it as a private business than as a public company because you're, in a sense, under the radar. You don't have 10 Ks and 10 Qs that people can go through to see exactly what's going on. So that's the first stop. See if you can extract value from the cash flows. Second stop, let's talk about increasing value from growth. Of course, we know the, the equation that drives it is return on capital times reinvestment rate is the growth. So to increase your value, increase your growth rate, you have to either reinvest more or reinvest better, right? How do you reinvest more? You can take more projects, assuming you have them. Or you can do big acquisitions. Reinvesting more is easy. But reinvesting more will increase your growth, but it'll increase your value only if the return on capital you make is higher than your cost of capital, right? So increasing your growth rate by itself is not value enhancing. Increasing growth with returns that exceed the cost of capital is what creates value. And that effectively allows you to frame marketing. In a sense, as we go through each, set, each part of this, I'm going to call on the disciplines that I've kind of avoided through the entire semester. There's that marketing class you took, right? I remember taking that class too. Maybe it's changed since it's been 30 years. But I was taught the four Ps. I forget some of the Ps already. But ultimately, I was told there are two big strategies you can adopt in marketing. One is to be a pricing leader. The other is going to be a volume leader. What do pricing leaders do? They go for low margins and high volume, the Walmart model. Volu that's what volume leaders go for. Pricing leaders go for high margins and low turnover. The return on capital can actually be written as the operating margin times, times the turnover ratio. So you can end up with a high return on capital even though you have low margins if you can sell huge amounts. Or you can end up with high returns in capital with low volume if you can make up with, you're saying, why can't I go for high margins and high turnover? Well, that's going to be tough to do. If you can pull it off, all the more power to you. That's what Apple's been able to do with the, smart, with the iPhone. And as you do this, the one cautionary note I would offer you is you're sitting there saying, if I do this, if I do that, if I do that, for, don't forget that the rest of the world can also do stuff. Because all too often, especially with marketing strategies, one of the things I think that gets companies into trouble is they act like they're the only sensible ones. They can see everything and everybody else just stays where they are. But some basic game theory has to come into play, which is when you cut prices, what are you hoping will happen? That everybody else will stay where they are, you can sell more. But if you cut prices and they also cut prices, what are you going to end up with? The same turnover ratio you used to, but a much lower return on capital. So ask the airlines how, how well that went for them through the 80s and the 90s. So when you think about growth, don't just think about higher growth. Think through the consequences of what that higher growth of for value. In fact, I'm going to show you the results of a McKinsey study that looked at different ways of growing. Because often you go into a company and say, you can do this, you can do this. You give them a whole menu of things they can do to grow faster. What McKinsey actually has as a database that allows them to do some very interesting pragmatic research and shows up in the McKinsey Quarterly, which I've mentioned before. It's, a, it's free. If you get on, on the McKinsey website, you can sign up for it. And what this article did was it went back and looked at 50 years of internal data that McKinsey had accumulated on their clients adopting different growth strategies. And then they ranked them from very best to very worse in terms of value creation. So the way to read this was, this tells you for every million dollars invested in a strategy, how much value was created by that strategy. So let's look at the top. Very best strategy, historically, for a company to grow is to introduce a new product. 
A million dollars invested creates between 1.75 to $2 million in additional value. Classic example again is Apple, right? The iPod, the iPhone. You think this is great, every company should go after this. The downside is, it's a very skewed strategy. If it works, it gives you a big upside, but lots of times it doesn't work. Like where? Microsoft would be a classic counterexample to a company that tries to keep introducing new products, but none of them stick. The second best strategy is expanding an existing market, either geographically, which is what Coca-Cola and Levi Strauss did in the 1980s, or into new businesses. Take an existing business and move into new businesses. So when Bayer found that aspirin worked to minimize heart, that's a new business you're entering into. Now you take that baby aspirin every night, even though you don't have a headache because you help. So that's expanding an existing market. A million dollars invested creates between 0.3 and 0.75 million. Maintaining or growing share in a growing market. That's not a bad strategy. What would be a good example? The smartphone business from 2011 through 2015, you know, you could be Apple and your market share might be staying at 26%, but the overall market is going 15 or 20% a year. You're going to be okay. And now we get to the two most questionable strategies. The first is competing for share in a stable market. A million dollars invested, you can see, you can see the graph go off into the left here. That means a million dollars invested actually can destroy value as much as increase value. Why is it so difficult to create value? By competing for market share in a stable market. How do you get a higher market share in a stable market? What do you have to do? You have to cut prices, right? So you get the growth, but with the lower margins. Your competitors cut prices too. Not a great strategy. But the worst strategy that McKinsey found looking at their 50 years of data to grow was, I will leave it untouched. Because if you want to know why, just go back and watch the last session. The way I use this is actually, to me, when companies announce new strategies for growing and when they tell me how they're going to grow, I'm going to draw in history. So if your company, an investment in, you've invested in this company, it's been in your portfolio for three years, you've liked the way the company's run, and managers announce with a lot of fanfare that they're now going to do a big acquisition. You know what that should be a signal to you to do? Sell and move on. I know it's cynical, but you're saying you're fighting history when you do this. You could be the best intention managers out there, but history suggests that your odds are low at succeeding. Now let's talk corporate strategy. Luckily, I don't know much about it, so this won't last very long. But any time you talk about building up strategic advantages, there are two things that go into my valuation that, that, that come from that. The first is what you make over and above the cost of capital, right? The capacity to earn above the cost of capital is determined by your competitive advantages. And how long I let you keep doing that is also a function of how strong those competitive advantages are. So if you're a company that, that I've been asked to turn around, or I give you a company to turn around, and you look around, this, is a, this company has no competitive advantages. Your value is going to reflect that, right? It's a problem, I think, that you would face if I brought you in to run HP, or Yahoo's operating business. In fact, I would say about 70% of US companies now, if I say, what's this company's competitive advantage, you'd have a really tough time coming up with it. And you can already see that creating value in this company is going to be really difficult. So what's your job as a CEO? I mean, ultimately, this is truly what a CEO's job is, is to figure out ways to come up with either new competitive advantages for a company or augment existing ones. So the risk of generalizing, let me offer you four potential competitive advantages that could go into the player. The first is brand name. Remember we talked about the value of a brand name? is you're able to charge a higher price for the same product. If you have a brand name, don't let it slip away. There are companies that have, right? Quaker Oats. One point in time, this iconic brand name in cereal. Let it slip away. Apple, from 93 to 99, let an iconic brand name almost slip away. So if you don't have a, but if you, so if you have a brand name, this might be 70% of your value protected. If you don't have a brand name, you could try to create a brand name. In fact, you see all these technology companies, in a sense, trying to do that, right? To create a brand name. 
including companies like Uber. They, for them, the brand name has to be such that when you get into a city and you see Uber, Lyft, and some other ride-sharing companies, I trust these Uber guys. Amazon. If it's three days to Christmas and you're ordering something and you want it delivered by this Christmas, not next Christmas, Amazon will do it. And for an online retailer, this is what drives your brand name. So that's brand name. The second is, maybe you can get some legal protection against competition. It would be nice if the government stepped in and act as your enforcer. In the pharmaceutical companies, where does it show up? In patents, right? But be very careful what you wish for. Because governments never do something out of the goodness of their hearts. There's always another side to this picture. In return for that protection, they might want something back. I'll give you a classic example. Most of you are too young to remember the time when your phone company was a regulated monopoly. You know what a regulated monopoly is? First, you know what the worst thing about being a monopoly is? Everybody hates you. You're the monopoly, you're the phone company, you're the water company, everybody hates you. How do you get back at them? If you're a good monopoly, you say, you hate me, I'll charge you 40% more. It'll make you feel a lot better about being hated. Okay? So if you're Andrew Carnegie, he said, I don't care if you think of me as a monopoly. Here, pay 50% more, I feel much better now. But the problem with being a regulated monopoly is everybody hates you because you're a monopoly. But when you get ready to raise prices by 50%, what happens? You're regulated. You've got to go in front of the regulatory commission. They say 2% this year. This is the worst of all worlds, right? You're hated, and you can't even do much about it. So if you're a company which is offered this legal protection from competition, before you accept it, make sure you're not giving up pricing power. If you can preserve pricing power, OK, go for it. The third is switching costs. This morning, I was thinking about the tech company life cycle. It's going to be my next blog post. I mean, tech companies live these short, I would say brutal, but kind of glorious lives. I think there's an insect that has a 24-hour life that supposedly gets born, has a happy 24 hours, and then dies. A lot of tech companies are like that, right? You grow really fast. Why? Because there's almost no restrictions in entry. You can scale up quickly because there are no capital in, you know, investments you've got to make. Your products and services tend to be such that consumers are not stuck on them. They're willing to switch. So you grow very fast. This is good news, right? So you now become a large tech company. Usually if you get to a mature phase as a company, you get to live off the fat for a long time. Coca-Cola, McDonald's. Think of how long they were able to stay there. As a tech company, don't enjoy the view too much. Because you're now at the peak. It's very quickly going to turn around. You know why? The same forces that made it easy for you to climb, which is easy entry, easy scaling up, consumers are willing to switch, now starts to cut against you. So if you look at tech company life cycles, it's like looking at this very steep mountain. And if you're the manager of a tech company then, here's what you have to do. You have to burn the bridges you took to come across the river. You know what I mean by that? Use the easy entry and the easy scaling up to get bigger. And then once you get bigger, you got to say, OK, I'm going to make life really difficult for the next few people who are coming. Very uncharitable of you to do this. But you're running a business. So what do you have to do? You have to make it more difficult for people to enter your business. You have to increase the costs of scaling up. And you got to get your customers stuck to you. By doing what? By increasing the cost of them switching out. And it's been a long time since we've talked about a Microsoft success. But remember when, I, I wouldn't say remember when, because you'd have been, might, you know, might not have been born, when they introduced Microsoft Office. I still have preserved my Mac World magazines from the 1980s. And in the 1980s, word processing and presentation programs were really garage businesses. Basically, people would start another word processing program. There was no cost to entry. People would enter in, they'd wipe out other people, and then move on. By introducing Office, Microsoft essentially said, if you're going to come into this business, you can't just come with a word processing program or a presentation program or a spreadsheet program. You've got to come into the suite. The cost of entry went up. And they said, we're going to introduce so many features that for you to compete with us, you now have to invest more capital than you used to. 
But most critically, they got people stuck. Because once you got to using Microsoft Office, it meant that to not use it, you had to abandon all the entire suite, right? Because I still remember when Lotus came up with an update in the late 80s. I had Office, and I used to use Lotus. And I said, I'm going to go back to Lotus. Just for my spreadsheet, it looks better. So I took a Lotus uh, chart, and I inserted in a Microsoft Word document, and the document disappeared. <laughs> Completely, it was gone. So I called the Microsoft helpline and said, what happened here? I was, no, I was, and they said, are you using a Lotus chart with the Word document? Yeah, yeah, I said, yes. I said, that won't work. You can, of course, abandon all of Office and go to Word Perfect and Lotus and something else, but it's all or nothing. That's switching costs. And who can blame them? If this is a business where you, I mean, and you see, with, with cell phone companies, this process play out, right? You walk by, let's say you have Verizon. You walk by an AT&T store. What do you see on the, on the window? Come on in, we'll pay you $400 to switch. Two minutes, we'll have you switched. That's in a moment of weakness, you walk in. You get switched, and then they give you this long contract that runs 15 pages to sign. You can't even read the clauses, the font is so small. But effectively, you signed that damn thing. You've signed away your life for about two years, right? Switching costs. And finally, if you have a cost advantage as a company, exploit it. So if it costs you less to produce products in your com competition, that's an advantage, right? So how do you get a cost advantage over your competition? Let me throw some companies at you. Aramco. You know what Aramco is, right? It's Saudi Arabian. It's a private Saudi Arabian oil company. Incredible cost advantage. How do they get it? The Saudi royal family endowed them with the cost advantage. Say, you have the rights to all the reserves in Saudi Arabia. So some cost advantages you don't earn. You're just endowed with them. A lot of natural resource companies. That's how they, Vale's natural resource, Petrobras's natural resources, they were endowed with. It can be earned. It can be earned because you made decisions along the way. I'll give you an example. In the late 80s, the Templeton funds actually started investing in Asia. This was well before anybody thought of Asia as a potential market. They started hiring people, collecting data, doing research. And in the 1990s, when Asia took off, the Templeton funds were among the first to be able to exploit it because the costs for them were lower because they'd already set up the infrastructure. They made the right judgment. They earned it. Or it could be strategic decisions you made about where to build your factories or what to do. The one thing about cost advantages is today's cost advantage can become tomorrow's cost disadvantage. And again, I'll give you one final example. Dell versus Compaq. In the 19, in, in 15 years ago, Dell won that battle, hands down. Much there, this cost advantage of Compaq, they were driving Compaq out of business. So Dell ruled the waves. Ten years later, Lenovo had the cost advantage. Dell is the one now at a cost disadvantage. But this is where your competitive advantages show up, isn't that, isn't that big? Last aspect where you can go into change values through your cost of capital. One, of course, and we've talk, you've talked about this in corporate finance, change the mix of debt and equity. Maybe we're using no, no debt to, with that trade-off driving how much. But there are three other ways. You can lower your cost of capital. Most of us tend to forget. Two relate to what drives betas. Remember, beta measures your systematic risk. And two things that drive that the, how high your beta is going to be is the first is what kind of product or service do you produce? How discretionary is it? The more discretionary your product and service, the higher your beta we set. So maybe, and I'm not saying this is going to be easy, maybe if you can make your product or service less discretionary. You've lowered your beta, right? How do you pull that off? How do you convince people that they cannot live with something that they're absolutely fine without? Well, one, of course, is that advertising works. It's supposed to do that, right? You will never dance again if you don't wear khakis. Those gap ads, they don't stick because we see ads all the time. But if advertising works, maybe this is where it's going to show up. It's going to move an item up the ranks. The other is you add something to your product that makes it something you cannot live without. 
Let's face it, 10 years ago, if I asked how many people in this room have cell phones, maybe half the people would have put up their hands. And I said, can you live without your cell phone 10 years ago? He said, eh, it's just a phone. Today I threatened to take away your cell phone. You will go down to, the, to your death. Say, no, don't take it away. If you take it away from me, I don't know who I am, where I live, what I do. <laughs> My whole life is in there, right? Hey, it's worked. I've made, you know, they made it. Something you can't, I mean, that's a one thread that works with my, would used to be work with my daughter until she got to be 18 and doesn't work anymore. So I'll take away your cell phone. Ah, oh, please don't do that. Anything else you can take away, take away my allowance for the next 10 years, but don't take away my cell phone. The second is if you have high fixed costs, remember what it does to your beta, right? It makes your earnings more volatile. So if you can reduce your fixed cost structure, you've in a sense lowered your beta. And how can you do that? Well, if you look at the entire phenomenon of outsourcing as a generic term, what you've done is you've taken an expense that used to be within the company and moved it outside, right? So instead of co having copiers all over the building, you have copying as an outside service. What do you gain by doing it? Maybe you're not saving money, but it becomes a variable cost now rather than a fixed cost. The other phenomenon, at least that you're seeing across the developed markets, is unions and companies, when they negotiate, it's not just about the level of wages that they're negotiating about, it's about the flexibility in that structure. In other words, if things get bad, that you have the right to lay off people. Those show up as lower betas, less fixed costs. And finally, if you've mismatched your debt to your assets, it increases your default risk, right? Using short-term debt to fund long-term assets, dollar debt to fund euro assets, you're increasing your risk. Get rid of that mismatch. And you can do it very quickly now in today's markets with swaps and derivatives. So what I'm saying is don't think of cost of capital just in terms of mix in debt and equity. There are other ways also to lower your cost of capital. So let's try this. Okay? So this is a valuation I did in 2005 of SAP, a very un-German German company. Okay? Very un-German in the sense it's tech, it's high, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's innovative. It's not that German companies can't be innovative, but the company that actually was you know, very flexible in, its, in, its, in the way it approached the market. Successful company. I'll give you the value that I got 106 euros per share, but rather than focus on the value, focus, think of being somebody I brought in to run the company and think about things you might want to change in the company. So remember there are three things you can fix, right? You can fix. The existing investments are not efficient, you can fix them. If the growth is potentially able to create more value, you can fix that. And if the cost of capital doesn't look optimal, you can fix that. So let me start with the existing income. The existing income, they made about 1.4 billion. Their margins were actually higher than the sector margin. So you look at that and what do you say? Well, they managed pretty well already. So that doesn't work, so the cash flow box is gone. Then you look at the growth. Right now, they're reinvesting about 57%, not bad. They're making about a 20% return on capital, which is pretty good. So at least based on those numbers, you're saying, well, there's not much I can do there either. The growth is about 11.44%. You go to the cost of capital, and they're about 99% equity, 10% debt. And you say, oh, okay, maybe this is something I can fix. That doesn't look like very much debt. All I'm trying to say is when you look at a company like this, which is fairly well managed, there are not that many places you can go to fix a company. In this case, the one thing that I did tried to do was looked at the debt ratio for SAP and looked at what had happened to the cost of capital. That 1% debt sounded low. The optimal debt ratio for SAP is about 30% debt. So maybe if I can go from 1% to 30% debt, that'll lower my cost of capital. So if I brought you in, that's perhaps the only really big change you can make. The other thing I should have mentioned is when I talked about the growth is SAP in 2005 was still very, very focused on Europe and North America. They were not paying any attention to Asia. So the second thing you might say is, hey, that's where the growth is going to be. Maybe you should reinvest more there. So here's what I did for SAP. Remember the original value I got was 106 euros. I said, reinvest more in emerging markets. Easier said than done, but I said, no, why not? No, not, not miracles, 50, 70, 70%. I did leave the return on capital at the existing return on capital, assuming they could make that in the emerging markets. But I also pushed up the cost of capital for the higher risk of being in emerging markets. So more investment in emerging markets, and I did change the debt ratio to 30% debt, 70% equity. With those two changes put in, the value per share that I get is 127 euros. You go back two pages, it was 106 euros. 
It's now 127 euros. 21 divided by 106 is exactly 20%. So maybe those bankers are right after all. Maybe the control premium is 20%. Works for this company. But let's see why it's not going to generalize. This is Blockbuster in 2005. You know how Blockbuster grew from nothing to a big company, right? What was the strategy? It rolled up privately owned video stores around the country and became an incredibly successful video rental store. But the golden days ended at around 2001 or 2002 when two forces came on top of them. One was Netflix in its original form where they'd mail you your videos and you'd mail them back. And the other was Walmart off started offering these vending machine kind of things where you could get a... So they were being squeezed on both ends and people weren't coming into their stores. But nobody at Blockbuster seemed to notice that nobody was coming into their stores. They kept opening more stores and more stores and still more stores. The company in denial. How does that show up? By the time I looked at them, their reinvestment rate was 27%, which means they're opening new stores, and the return on capital was down to 4%. This is exactly the kind of company you want to come into because to create value, what do you have to do? Just stop doing. This is the easy, you know, just to come in and say, no more store openings, you've just increased the value 20%. It should be easy enough to do. The debt ratio is about 50-50. So basically, you look at this company, its cost of capital is about 6.17%. It's growing, but it's growing really badly. You say, man, I can fix this company. Here, if I, all I did was made the return on capital equal to the cost of capital, which is not asking for miracles. It says, stop investing in bad net present value projects. My value, which was $5.13 per share, goes up to $12.47 per share. So it's my control premium here. 150%. You know why I picked Blockbuster to value at that time, right? Carl Icahn had just targeted Blockbuster. And I was interested, why did he target it? And you look at the company, see exactly why. This is exactly the kind of company you target, saying, you guys are insane, stop opening new stores and shrink the company. Two very different companies, two very different consequences. And that's, effect, that's going to be my framework for thinking about control. When I think about the value of control of a company, I'm thinking about two issues. One is, can I change the way this company is run? What is the probability that I can replace the management of the company? Or somebody can. It doesn't have to be me. And that's going to look at corporate governance questions and how the company is structured. And the second question I'm going to ask is, assume I can change the management of the company, how much can the value be changed? So let's start with the easy scenario. If you have a perfectly managed, perfectly run company, what's going to happen? The change in firm value is zero. The expected value control is zero. So that's one limiting case. If you have a company like Blockbuster, it gets more complicated, right? Because there's a big change in value. But your expected value of control will then depend on what the probability is that you can change the way this company is run. Which means as an investor, you have to assess that probability at least implicitly. So here are some of the things you might want to think about. When you think about the likelihood of change, all those buzzwords you hear out there start to matter. Corporate governance. That's what I hear. Corporate governance means you get a chance to change the management. The entry of activist investors in the company. Don't change the value of the company, but they can change the probability of management changing. And if you have a hostile acquisition, you have a 100% probability of change, assuming the acquisition goes through. So it's actually a lens through which you can assess what the expected value of control is, and through that, what the value of a voting share should be against a non-voting share, what the premium should be in a hostile acquisition. So a little bit about the probabilities of of es estimating management change. This is more art than science still. So if you come to me at the company and say, can you give me a number for the property? Is it 15, is it 35, is it 55? Let me suggest some variables that seem to determine the likelihood that you can get change. The first is companies where the stock price and the earnings have done badly are more likely to see management changes than companies that have done well. The second is, Companies where boards are small and independent, you're more likely to see chains than boards which are large and full of insiders. Third, the ownership structure matters. If you have companies with a lot of institutional holdings with very little insider holdings, you're more likely to see CEO change than if you don't have that. 
And finally, CEO change seems to be more likely in some industries rather than others. And there seems to be this ripple effect. Once you get a, hot, a change of management in a, in a sector, you start to see a lot of changes happen in the same sector. You think that still doesn't give me a number. You know whether you've ever used this technique called probit? You know what a probit is? You know how to run a regression, right? You have a dependent variable and independent variables. A multiple regression, that's what you have. In a probit, your dependent variable is actually a zero, one variable. Well, you're saying, what are you talking about? You can either default or you cannot default. You can be acquired or not be acquired. You can have a management change or not have a management change. So you go back in time, and let's say you have a sample of 40,000 companies. You isolate the 1,000 companies with CEOs change and the 39,000 companies that they did not. So you have one zero, one for the companies where there was change, zero for the rest. So you're saying, where's that going to go next? Remember the four variables I listed in the previous page, you know, how well your stock has done, the earnings, the board structure. Let's say I list those as independent variables and I run a regression against a zero one variable. That's what a probit is, you see. What's the end result? You'll have something that looks like a regression, but when you plug in the numbers for your company into that equation, you will actually get a probability of change in your company. You can say, this is what my stock price change was, this is what my earnings change was, this is what my board looks like. You put them in, you come up with an expected value, there's a 55% chance. How often have I done this? Never. Why? Because I really don't think that finessing this is going to give you much more than a talking point. When you look at a company, basically just think high, average, low, none. It might be a family-run company, zero. Right? And that alone is useful because, in a sense, it, it's going to show up in almost every aspect of investing. So if you're doing a hostile acquisition, it's a control premium. If you're valuing publicly traded companies, the market price for a badly managed publicly traded company is actually a weighted average of your status quo value and your optimal value. And we'll talk a little bit about how this works out. It actually is a way of thinking about the premium that voting shares should trade at relative non-voting shares. And in private companies, here's how it shows up. If you try to sell me 49% of your private business, I will pay you a lot less than if you pay me by, sell me 51% of that same business. You see, that's only a 2% difference. That 2% difference means that you run the business with 51, with 49, I continue to run the business. So let's take each of these and let's see how the expected value of control helps us. Let's start with the simplest scenario. Remember the two numbers I got for uh, Blockbuster, 12.47 and 5.40 or five five dollars and something. Blockbuster is actually trading at 9.50 when I did these two valuations. So my status quo value is well below Blockbuster's current price. The this, the optimal value is higher. In fact, it was trading at only about an eight or seven and a half dollar price before Carl Icahn showed up. So you can see already why the price bounced up. It's moving towards the optimal value. But let's say you decide to do a hostile acquisition of Blockbuster. You got 950 as the price. You got twelve dollars and forty seven cents as the value you think Blockbuster would have if you ran it. Would you be willing to pay the entire two ninety seven as a premium? You say, well, that's a fair value. In fact, if you pay the 297, you will get a fair deal, but think of what you've just done. You're going to do the hard work of fixing the company, right? And who's getting all the benefits? Blockbuster shareholders get all the benefits. So when you do control premiums, it's not the price that you want to pay, it's your reservation price. You want to stop before you get there, but that's the first place you're going to see this play out. Here's the second. I would argue that every publicly traded company, what you observe as a market price is actually a weighted average of two numbers. The status quo value, the existing management running it, and the optimal value. So remember the 513 and the 1247 that I came up with as my two values? I told you the existing price is 950. You can actually back out the probability of change happening in the company by just, it's, it's one equation, one unknown. You solve for it. There's a 59.5% chance that management will change in the company. What did I say the price was before I can showed up? It was 820, which means if I plugged in 820, there was a 42% chance. So the very fact that I can shows up as an activist investor has increased the property from 42 to 59 and a half, which is where your price increase comes from. This is why when you see a company targeted by a Bill Ackman or a Carl Icahn, you will see the price pop up. 
is because if nothing else, it's put the company into play. It's increased the probability from what it was before to what you think it will be now. That's why activist investors matter. So tomorrow I passed a law that removed activist investors from the space. I said, no. What's going to happen to the price of Blockbuster? It's going to drop back. It's not just Blockbuster, right? Every stock you're going to see a reassessment of the price. And the worst run companies will see the biggest drops in price because in a sense you've taken away the chance of fixing them. Conversely, when you see laws that actually improve corporate governance, you should see the prices across the board go up, and more so for badly managed companies than well-managed companies. So when you think about the value of a share in a publicly traded firm, it is the status quo value plus the property control change times the value of changing divided by the number of shares. So that's what you're seeing in the $9.50 or the $8.20. Now let's play a game about voting shares and non-voting shares. This is if you have one class of shares. What if Blockbuster had voting and non-voting shares? I'm going to take an extreme view. And I'll tell you in a minute why this is extreme. Let's assume the voting shares are the ones who essentially have control under there. They decide whether somebody can change the company. And technically that's true, right? The voting shares control the destiny of the company. And let's say that they can claim the entire expected value of control. I'll talk about why this might be difficult, but let's say they can. See what's going to happen to the voting share price? It's going to be the, st so if you look at the non-voting shares, you're just going to get the status quo value. The voting shares will get the status quo value plus the expected value of control, and they get to keep that entire amount. How would this work in an acquisition? What would you have to do as voting shares to be able to pull this off? Have you heard of two-tier acquisitions? In a two-tier acquisition, you're allowed to offer a different price for the voting and the non-voting shares. So if you get allowed two-tier acquisitions, you know exactly what's going to happen. The voting shareholders are going to negotiate all or the bulk of the premium, and they're going to leave nothing for you. It's one of the things that pissed me off the most about being a shareholder in MBEV when Interbrew bought them. In, in two, I was a shareholder. I open up the newspaper, I hear about this acquisition of MPEV, I'm doing a little dance saying, this is great. Two months later, the acquisition gets completed, look at my price, nothing happened to it. The premium paid was almost 100%. You know what happened on that particular deal? Remember those common and preferred shareholders? I was a, I was a preferred shareholder, lucky me. The common shareholders control the voting rights, negotiated to claim almost the entire premium on the acquisition. So value voting shares and non-voting shares reflects expect, which means if you have a perfectly managed, perfectly run company, what's going to happen to the difference in prices between those shares? They're going to go towards zero. So Google class A, class B, class C right now, you don't see much difference in price. You know when that price difference is going to widen? Is if Google stumbles, if it does something that it shouldn't be doing, you say, oh my God, I'd like to change the way Google is run. And you look at the shares and you have Google Class C shares, good luck to you. That's when you're going to see price differences widen. Happened in News Corp. When they had those scandals, you saw the price difference widen. Whenever you have two class of shares, that's exactly what you're going to see. So as an example, I tried this on MBAP. Okay. I'm sorry, I tried this in Embraer. And at the time that I tried this, is here's what I estimated as value. My status quo value was 12 and a half billion reais. My optimal value was 14.7 billion. So some change. It had 242.5 million voting shares and 476.7 million non-voting shares. So here's the process for estimating the value of each. To get the value per non-voting share, I always start with that. I took the status quo value, saying, hey, that's all you're going to get and divided by the total number of shares outstanding. So essentially, I split it up among all the shareholders. The value that I got for the non-voting shares was $17.38. To get the voting shares, I started with the $17.38 as my base. I attached a very low probability to change at Embraer, because it still has a big government influence in how it's run. Took the difference in values, and divided by just the voting shares, the value per voting share is $19.19. .19. In the aftermath of the Petrobras and the Vale scandals, you're starting to see, at least in the big Brazilian companies, a, a bigger divergence between common and preferred shares. People have suddenly woken up to the fact that corporate governance matters. 
And that's the caution I offer to people who buy shares in Alibaba and Facebook and Google is right now you're okay with, what the, with, the, with how things are set up. You don't care, you say, what's the big deal? One day there will be a big deal where you won't like what Jack Ma is doing or Mark Zuckerberg is doing. Don't come complaining that. Because that's exactly where you're going to start saying, that's why I need voting rights. And finally, for a minority discount, let's suppose I value a private business. Right? Let's have come up with the 1.6 billion as my status quo value, 2, bi 2 million as my optimal value. So you're, you're, you, let's say you own the private business, I've given you two numbers. You offer me 49% of this company. What's the highest price I'm willing to, offer, to, to pay you? 49%, what do I get? I get no control of this business. With no control, the value is 1.6 million, so 49% of 1.6 million is 784,000. I offer you 51% of the same company. 51% of 2 million is 1.02 million. That 2% difference translates into almost a one-third difference in prices. So if the Dolans offer you 49% of the Knicks, this is the worst managed franchise in history. Okay? Pay a very low price. If they offer you 51%, it's going to be a much, much higher price. The value of control shows up with private businesses in terms of the controlling stake versus the non-controlling stake. So let me close this discussion because in a sense, it's easy, right? It's cash flows, growth, and risk. Anybody can do it. And that is a problem if you're a consulting firm because if you're a consulting firm, anybody can do it is not a good thing. So what do you have to do? You have to make it look mysterious. Usually add an acronym, that always helps, an acronym that's never been seen before. And make it something that people need you to keep coming back every year to tell them what to do next. This is in a sense the rule book for every consulting firm. So what they have to do is take what's obvious and make it mysterious. And what they do is very simply to find something that, that stands in for value. So here's the sales pitch. You're a company, you've been taught intrinsic valuation, you think you know, so I come in as BCG, or as uh, McKinsey, and I say, you know what? Everything you've learned, it doesn't work. That discounted cash flow stuff, it's too complicated. You really can't manage a company with that. We'll give you a substitute. We'll give you one number. If you watch this number, everything's going to be okay. And I'll take two acronyms that have a pretty long history here and talk about how they try to do it. One is something called EVA, which was a very hard concept in the 1990s. Where Stern Stewart, this consulting firm in New York, you know, went around the country saying, this is all you need to do is compute the EVA, track it, everything's going to be okay. The other is a concept called CFROI, which Holt Associates in Chicago came up with. Both are one, single numbers. So the idea was if you have EVA, if you can keep just increasing the EVA, you're managing your company well. With CFROI, if you increase the CFROI, the same effect. What these, these offer is simplicity in, instead of complexity. Very simply, let me define both so you can see what special attributes each has. You know what the EVA is? It's the difference between return on capital and the cost of capital. Incredibly novel idea. Multiplied by the capital invested to make it a dollar value. We've been talking about return on capital and cost of capital all through this class, right? You don't even need to have gone, come to this class. You want your return on capital to be higher than your cost of capital or lower than your cost of capital? You want to be higher. You want a bigger difference or a smaller difference? Bigger difference. Do you want to make the bigger difference on more money or less money? More money. Okay, you got EVA. <laughs> right? That's basically what they're saying. Make a big spread, make it on a lot of money, this is good. And CEO said, oh, what insight. I've never thought about this before. CFROI is like an internal rate of return. Capital budgeting, how, you know how we compute the input? It's a real instead of a nominal. Why real? Because it makes it sound more mysterious. And you want to make an IRR that exceeds your cost of capital, CFROI tries to do the same thing. The bottom line though is, they're still working with the same intrinsic value model. And if you do it right, you should get exactly the same value. If you value a company with a traditional discounted cash flow valuation, use EVA or use CFROI. So let me back that up. Let's assume you have a very simple company to value. It's very simple in what sense? It's a company that right now has a book value of 100 million, is expected to make a return on capital of 15% forever on that book value, and a cost of capital of 10%, so it's earning an excess return. 
It's expected to make additional investments of 10 million every year for the next five years, and those investments are also going to make more than the cost of capital. Beyond year five, the company will keep growing, but the projects it takes after year five will earn their cost of capital. So it has existing investments that make excess returns. For the next five years, it can add to them and make excess returns, and beyond year five, it stops making excess returns. If you ask me to do an EVA valuation of this company, here's how I do it. I'd start with the book value, because you're building off that base. I take the present value of the excess returns you make on it, the 5% excess returns in perpetuity. That's a 50 million. Then I take the present value of the value created with each. So in EVA, you start with book value and just add up the excess values you create. So it comes from that return on capital being greater than the cost of capital. The value you get is 170.85 million. So if I was turns to it, I'd say, look, Incredibly scientific approach, 170.85, much more precise than that DCF approach you used to use. Let's see if that's true. I took the company and I did a traditional DCF, free cash flow of a firm, cost of capital, terminal value. So this is my you know, operating income, net capex, free cash flow of the firm. Beyond year five, I assume that I estimate the reinvestment rate based on the return on capital. What do, I, what do I have to do to complete the DCF? I have to discount the cash flows. Remember what the value was with EVA, 170.85, right? When I do my DCF, I get 170.85. All excess return models, there are a whole body of these. Essentially, just slice up the cash flows differently. Rather than discounting the entire cash flows, they take book value and add the excess returns separately. And if you do it right, you should get exactly the same value. The biggest problem with EVA was, I mean, the, the, the good things that came out of EVA, one was it showed that growth was not what created value. For those people who are naive enough for going for just growth, they said it's excess returns that create value, and that's the good news. And it allowed you to break out how much of the market value of a company came from these good investments and how much from book value. So that was the good news. The bad news was that Stern Stewart oversold this concept. As all consulting firms do, they, they sold it as the magic bullet. They said, if you do this, everything's going to be great. They sold it as a basis for management compensation. What sense? They said CEOs should be judged based on what they do to EVA. If they increase the EVA, they should be given bonuses. If they decrease, not total present value, but year-to-year -year EVA changes. And what we're going to talk about in the very last session of the small piece left of EVA is to look at what happens when you let managers lose and tell them, go increase next year's EVA. We're going to talk about the dysfunctional ways you can increase EVA while destroying value in a company. And that's, I think, the core problem with all of these acronym-based approaches is by taking the simple, the, by, by going for simplicity, you always leave openings. And if you compensate people based on that simple measure, they are going to exploit those openings. So make sure you send me your numbers by Sunday and on Monday we'll kind of do a big class review using your project numbers as the basis.
But maybe as a tech company, correct, you're right. You might, in the end, still go back and say, I still believe it's an auto company. So the fact that it's priced correctly as a tech company doesn't mean much to them. But should I, should I compare it to other tech companies, or should I add tech companies to my No, sample? just add group just to tech companies. Don't just add tech companies to, to auto. the whole company. Because either people are comparing it to auto or to tech. They're not doing this mingled mix. Uh, because if, if you look at equity research, that equity research, Tesla has actually given not to the auto and the same end. Oh. And tech as in, would I compare it to what? Google, Facebook, uh, you know, Google, 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 the big tech, yeah. It's basically, you, it's, it's yeah, all those high name, high profile tech Thank you. Cheers. 